Hello, everybody. This is Ken Forster with uh, Momenta Partners. We are um, going to wait a few more minutes. We've already got about 80 people, but over 500 people registered for this. So uh, we'll start in about a minute or two to make sure everybody uh, gets an opportunity to listen to this. So give us a moment. Good day, everyone, and welcome to our Momenta Digital Industry Impact Webinar on Smarter Assets. My name is Ken Forster, and I'm the Executive Director of Momenta Partners and Momenta Ventures. So just a few housekeeping notes to begin with. Today's presentation is being recorded. We plan for a Q&A session at the end, so please submit questions in the Bright Talk question pane anytime to the presentation, and we'll get to them at the end. And links to the presentation and the recording will be sent to all of you within 24 hours. Today we have an all-star panel of Momenta Ventures portfolio companies and their founding CEOs. Dale Calder of Rev2, based in Boston. John Sobel of Sight Machine, based in San Francisco. And Gilberto Luero of SmartX AI, based in Porto, Portugal. I'll be emceeing the first part today, and Blaine, our advisory partner in, at Momenta, will be driving the Q&A on the latter half. So for today's agenda, I'll start with a brief bit of context setting, establishing the opportunity and challenge for smarter assets. Then we'll turn it over to each of our companies to discuss what I call impact studies, discussing best practices in helping their customers create impact with their solutions. Finally, Blaine will run the Q&A session, and I'll close this up with some uh, key takeaways. So let's talk a little bit about context. Momenta Partners are digital industry growth partners. Since 2012, we focused on the digital transformation of energy, manufacturing, smart spaces, and supply chain. Through our three practices, we advise, place key executive talent for, and invest in digital industry leaders and emerging innovators. We've worked with over 125 key industrials and technology companies, placed over 200 leaders, including several chief digital officers, and invested in over 40 companies. We consider ourselves venture industrialists, building sustainable ecosystems and financial value in our ecosystem of portfolio companies across our two funds. Today, we're pleased to feature three of our key companies from Fund One. Again, Rev2, SmartX, and Sight Machine. So digital industry is not a singular event, but a culmination of technology waves, leading from centralized computing to distributed and ubiquitous computing. Powered by Moore's law, this has led to dramatic decreases in the cost of sensors, bandwidth, processing, and storage, making technology accessible for you in the simplest of use cases. The technologies emerging from these waves, from internet, social, and mobile, to big data, analytics, IoT, and robotics, are converging to create what we call combinatorial innovation. Jeremy Rifkin in his seminal book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, outlines how this innovation is manifesting itself in new business models, economic paradigms and disruptive scenarios, the chart to your right, if you will. As an example, internet plus mobile plus geo positioning, when coupled with the new economic paradigm of the sharing economy, really catalyzed ride sharing companies like Lyft and Uber. This is the foundational patterns that underlie digital industry. Now, the adoption of these technologies, really on key digital industry sectors such as energy, manufacturing, supply chain, is forecast to unleash over $100 trillion of value for society and industry per the World Economic Forum, creating new business opportunities for industry and higher standards of living for society. So there is great value out there. 
clicking down on the general industry space and focusing on asset-specific markets of industrial building and infrastructure, this is a market worth over 600 billion euro by 2022 per Bosch. The particular high value use cases that we outlined today are those in the right hand section of the chart produced by Bain. Manufacturing quality control, remote monitoring, asset tracking, and predictive maintenance. These place high in value, but often require so called proof of concepts and pilots to develop their introduction and adoption, helping to determine ROI and mitigate risk. So today, while we'll talk about those use cases, it's really the adoption or efficient adoption of those by our, our customers that we really want to focus on. So how is that adoption going? Well, Microsoft also released a great report in 2019 titled IoT Signals Report, where they interviewed over 3,000 business leaders responsible for their digital transformations. Key industries covered were manufacturing, transportation, retail, healthcare, and government. In this report, they outlined 88% of respondents see IoT as critical to their business. That's great. 85% were already well into their first IoT project, even better. Yet only 23% had seen success so far. Even so, and interestingly enough, a whopping 75% expected to deploy even more quote-unquote IoT. So high intent, yet low impact. Now, the reasons outlined for that low impact likely shouldn't surprise most of us. Right? Pilots aren't easy to scale or productize. There's many times unclear business value or ROI. The impact many times is just too long term for a good pilot to really measure. Interesting note, though, that lack of technology or necessary technology um, and leadership support rated respectively fourth and fifth when typically – we would think well, the technology just wasn't mature. I didn't, you know, quote, unquote, the number one reason things fail is you don't have the leadership support. Those are actually dead last. So there is something to this. 88% intent, 23% impact. That looks like an opportunity to us. Now, since we're investors, um, it really is this observation that led us to create the digital industry impact series. For all of the low stats of project success and talk of pilot purgatory and troughs of disillusionment, we're constantly seeing real-world impact in our engagements and across our portfolio companies. So either we're really good investors and, uh, and we're picking you know, the winners, um, or um, maybe the stories and stats that we see out there in industry aren't telling the whole story, and I believe there's you know, parts of both that are probably true. So we created this series for practitioners, by practitioners, to showcase some of those winning companies, and more importantly, feature their leaders, sharing best practices on helping how they are helping their clients achieve impact in their business. So the first of the series is focused on smarter assets, and we plan to do these around other industry sectors and thematics as well. But in this one particular, very excited to feature Dale Calder, uh, CEO of Rev2, John Sobel, CEO of Sight Machine, and again, Gilberto Luero, CEO of SmartX. And by the way, they're all three founders of their companies as well. They will be showcasing a couple of their real-world solutions, chronicling more important success stories, and most importantly, exploring how they help their clients really drive impact. So with that, let me turn it over to Dale Calder of Rev2. Dale, take it away. Thank you, Ken, for the kind introduction. Rev2 is in the business of democratizing expertise. Expertise is not just about the documenting things in the form of manuals or knowledge-based articles, but it's also the understanding of what information is valuable and how and when to apply it. Rev2 stepped into the gap and created a solution that captures and intelligently distributes organizational know-how, where, when, and how it's needed. The management team of Rev2 has been together for over 10 years, in the case of my CTO, Jim, and I, we've been together over 20. Rev2 is our third company. Uh, you know, our last company, Exceda, we built into one of the leaders of the Internet of Things and is now part of ThingWorks from PTC. During our time at Exceda, we connected and gathered data from products of over 150 manufacturers. That experience in processing digital signals armed us with the insight that we used to build Rev2. Now, we all have a person like this in our company. You know, they've been around the company seemingly forever. 
You know, they've seen everything, worked on every product. They have a wealth of experience and know-how that can't be measured. And ultimately, they're the perfect answer for every problem. Unfortunately, these experts are retiring. And with their exodus, businesses are facing an unprecedented drain on real-world expertise on a scale that hasn't happened before. Conserving this expertise that is walking out the door and applying it across the organization is the mission of Rev2. So how do we do this? Rev2 solves problems the same way an expert does. Experts take descriptions of issues, they collect data, they use years of accumulated knowledge, and ultimately they converge on a solution. When Rev2 encounters their issue, it does the same thing. We use the knowledge that Rev2 has accumulated from the company's experts and its data sources, and we combine that with the problem's context. Rev2 can get this context digitally, either from an existing IoT system or via Rev2 innovation we call visual IoT. If digital data is not available, often cases it's not, you know, that's not a problem either. Rev2 can gather problem context directly from the person requesting help. So everything that Rev2 does is under AI control, from the questions the systems ask to which solutions to use. Rev2's AI considers current problem context, human observations, past experience solving similar problems, and factors such as cost and time. Now, when we were building Rev2, we thought it was critical to be able to embed this problem-solving ability everywhere it was needed. So in addition to operating it in traditional interfaces like apps and browsers, Rev2 has been embedded into business apps like Microsoft Dynamics 365 or Salesforce.com, actual products, the user interface of those products, and even virtual agents and robotic processes. Rev2 can even be used within AR, VR environments like HoloLens 2 and Realware. Now, I'm proud to announce that we're in the process of launching a ThingWorks interface for PTC's ThingWorks. Now, the 1,000 users of ThingWorks platform can embed Rev2's ability to capture and serve expertise directly into their ThingWorks dashboard. Of course, Rev2 can utilize ThingWorks and Kepler's data collection ability and provide context for the AI that can provide context for the AI and the problem analysis. Now, when a person's ability to solve problems and accomplish tasks are improved, organization performance improves. Rev2's deployments have been used to accomplish objectives as diverse as improving technician scheduling, empowering customer self-service, on-demand training, upskilling junior technicians, uh, call center assistance, uh, and of course, tribal knowledge capture. Uh, the results have been impressive. Customers have seen significant improvement in first-time fix rates, warranty cost reductions, and part utilizations, among others. Now, our first case study is a company called Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak's a world leader in packaging machines. These machines are enormous. They're typically two-story high. They can be the length of a basketball half court, and they have hundreds of thousands of parts. If a machine experiences downtime, it's a hardship for the owner-operator with significant cost accruing due to lost production. Machines can have thousands of faults, with each fault having root causes from five to 10 range to sometimes even over 50. Fixing all these cases requires a wealth of knowledge that only the most experienced technicians, which Tetra Pak call system specialists, have. Now Tetra Pak sells these machines globally and they operate an extensive support and service organization. These machines are often located in remote areas of the globe, making physical access very challenging. So Tetra Pak is also a leader in adopting Industry 4.0 and digitizing their activities. So Tetra Pak is working hard to utilize new technologies like Rev2 so their customers will benefit from this digitization. Now Tetra Pak's using Rev2 in a customer self-service environment. Rev2 empowers Tetra Pak customers to diagnose and solve problems as they occur. To do this, Tetra Pak has used the Rev2 app to capture system specialist expertise from the top issues that their customers experience. This expertise is captured as system specialists work on real machines solving real problems. An executive from Tetra Pak observed, 
if you can do a post on LinkedIn or Instagram, that's pretty much all you need to do to capture expertise in Rev2. Now, the workflow for Tetra Pak customers follows this pattern. When a problem occurs, like the one shown on the left, an operator pulls up a dynamic QR code on the machine itself. This QR contains data about the current issue. The data include things like system error conditions, process information, and the recent events that have occurred. The operator then used the Rev2 app to scan this QR, and this is the thing that we call visual IoT. Because the data is collected from the machine, regardless of whether it's connected to the internet or not. The problem shown is called an outfeed congestion issue. When something goes wrong in this area, a pileup like the one shown can happen pretty quickly. And remember, the machine is packaging hundreds of packages a minute, so it really doesn't take long to make a pile like the one you see here. An outfeed congestion problem can have over 40 different root causes, and getting to the exact issue in the least amount of time and in the most cost-effective manner is the benefit that Rev2 brings. In this case, once Rev2 scans the QR, sends the data to the AI engine for this class of product and provides either a recommended fix or asks additional questions required to converge on a diagnosis. All issues from this machine type globally contribute to AI, Rev2's AI education. Improving troubleshooting of these types of issues is a significant advantage for the Tetra Pak, for Tetra Pak's customers, reducing support calls, field service visits, travel costs, and most importantly, downtime. Empowering customers to help themselves improves customer satisfaction. Another use case for Rev2 is diagnosing predictive failure alerts. Predictive analytics is a very common use case for the Internet of Things. Live streams of data from a processor machine are used by an AI system to detect issues in the data that can indicate an impending failure. In this case, which I'm sad to say we're not at liberty to share the name of the company yet, a major industrial company is using Rev2 to guide its technicians through the identification of the root cause of its predictive failure alerts. The company Solutions uses an IoT system from a third party to monitor information from its connected assets. The IoT system's algorithms are able to detect potential deviations from the norm and raise alerts. And once the alert is raised, Rev2 is notified with the context of that alert. The context in this case is the data associated with the alert at time of detection. Rev2, Rev2's AI system analyzes the data and determines a likely set of causes. These causes provide Rev2 with a few things, first of which are the insight of what skills and parts may be required to fix the issue. This information is used to ensure that the right technician is dispatched with the right parts necessary for the job. Upon dispatch, Rev2 will then guide the technician through the optimal diagnostic process to fix to identify and fix the issue. Once the root cause is discovered, Rev2 updates the predictive failure system you know, of the root cause so that it can use that information in its analysis for the next event that would occur. This use case is a great example of using AI operating in a purely digital realm to trigger an AI that operates in both the digital and human realm to improve system uptime and guided worker actions. Now, in conclusion, Rev2's sole focus is really solving problems, you know, solving the problem of expertise availability. We're endeavoring to codify the expertise of your best people, make it available everywhere, and be able to empower your users, wherever they may be in the rest of your workforce, to benefit from that expertise. Looking forward to answering your questions. Now allow me to introduce our next speaker, John Sobel of Sight Machine. John, take it away. Thank you, Dale. Ken, thank you for having us, and it's a pleasure to join everybody for this conversation. I'm going to share a little bit of background about uh, Sight Machine very briefly, and then um, focus on what we're learning about helping large manufacturers get impact uh, at scale. This is uh, hard to read, but it's just a quick map of some of the industries that Sight Machine has worked in, a few things to emphasize about our experience. We have a, a product solution for making sense of uh, very varied uh, 
uh, large amounts of data generated on shop floors. And so we have a subs subscription software product that is designed for the enterprise manufacturer to take in data from all of the sources and systems that you find in factories, historians, ERP, SCADA, controls and automation, quality systems. And as everyone on the call appreciates, that data is highly varied and very difficult to work with. It took us many years to develop a product that can be universally applied across discrete and process industries. And these are examples of some of the industries and geographies that we've worked in. Uh, pharmaceutical, food and beverage, paper and packaging, automotive, electronics. And over the last 10 years, the company has developed some wonderful relationships with firms such as Momenta. We have an investor, uh, Eon, who is a large energy company in Europe, very focused on sustainability. As everyone appreciates, productivity and sustainability are two sides of the same coin. We've recently gotten very involved with the World Economic Forum. Microsoft's a wonderful partner. We work with McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Fujitsu, and others. And as Ken alluded to, we, like everybody else, spent years doing pilots. Um, we've really thought hard about how to engage with the enterprise manufacturer. And a very clarifying concept for us has been the idea of outcome. We provide a product. We work closely with companies to achieve outcome. And as I'll share in a moment, that focus on quantifiable outcome from the beginning of the conversation is really helpful and clarifying. I want to set up real quick what this looks like, talk about a couple case studies, and then share some thoughts about what we're learning. A lot of hard lessons along the way. This is an asset. The title of today's uh, discussion is Smarter Assets. This is a paper machine at a paper mill. And those of you who know this industry well will appreciate that uh, as it is operating, there are about 4,000 independent data sources emitting data about the behavior of this asset. Uh, these machines are intended to run uh, sometimes 24 hours, certainly many hours every day. And there are constant challenges with the quality of the paper being made and issues arising that cause the machine to go down. Uh, we work with uh, a large paper company, and this is one of their plants. The machine I just showed you is actually one of three machines. Uh, the machines at this site, uh, uh, the three machines at this site are located in one of the little brown buildings in the back. There's upstream operations um, in pulp, chemicals, wastewater. There's actually 15,000 data sources at this plant that we are streaming data from and continuously analyzing all at once. And I want to set up the challenge and the opportunity. Most plants, whether it's a paper mill or a really small plant somewhere else, have huge amounts of data, but they have great difficulty making sense of the data. And so the asset itself is challenging. The asset in combination with everything else going on at the plant is challenging. And the big opportunity that everybody has their eye on is the enterprise or even the supply chain. This particular company has 30 mills around the world. We're currently streaming data from 11. We expect to go to 30 shortly. And so there are huge amounts of data to be integrated uh, and understood at once. And this is what we do. The way we've learned to talk about this with our customers begins with the notion of value and outcome. And we've come to believe that whatever you may be producing as a manufacturer, they're really the same questions over and over again. On the left of this map, are four levers that influence production at any manufacturing facility. The throughput, the quality, the cost, and your ability to be flexible. And for each of these levers, there's some really simple questions that come up again and again. What's happening? What's changing? What's causing the change? How do we set things up to avoid variability? What's going to happen in the future? What do we want to do about that now? And how do we optimize across all these levers? And we overlaid on this uh, for today's conversation kind of a map of where the different types of math come in. And you find many companies begin uh, working with IoT and digital technology by focusing on something like AI or focusing on a use case. We've learned to begin the concept at a, the, the discussion at a much more fundamental concept. Where are the opportunities to create business value in your operation? What questions do we want to answer first? Let's get a technology solution that lets you move across this map and answer all of these questions. 
And then let's figure out what techniques we're going to invoke from our product. AI is a fancy word for a bunch of math. This is all math. Certain type of math is right for certain type of problems. Here's an example of um, a great success we had with a, um, uh, a, a paint company in India uh, in the past year. Uh, Asian Paints uh, has a very sophisticated IT team. At this first plant we began working at, we're now at um, six plants with them. They uh, had deeply studied uh, the processes, but even with abundant data and experience, it was very difficult to get real-time visibility into their production. And so the part of the map we focused on is throughput. What's the cycle time of the assets um, and the process? I just showed you a giant paper machine. Asian Paints line is very typical of many facilities. There are actually 200 assets in the line. And understanding the interaction and the data from all of them together is extremely difficult, no matter how good your IT team is, no matter how good your traditional tools. We were able to help them immediately, within two months of using our product, identify bottlenecks and sources of contention in their process. And within two months, um, through a hackathon that their operators held using our product, they were able to reduce cycle time by 7%. That's an extraordinary lift in productivity based on data they'd had all along, had been working with, but because they could see what was going on, they were able to have immediate impact. The next case study uh, relates to quality, and, and Ken spoke about how quality is really at the forefront of opportunity for digital. Quality is a really interesting use case because it requires combining contemporaneously process and quality data as they're generated. Many companies store both in a lake, but if you want to go back and figure out what happened, you have to retrospectively combine that data, and it's incredibly difficult. With a product like ours, the data is being combined as it's being generated. It's on different time scales, different sequences, different sources. We put it all together. And in this case, um, we were able to help this company with a very interesting problem, sustainability. Uh, glass is a hugely energy-intensive process. This, um, this process involves uh, putting material into a furnace. It takes about three days for the glass to come out. And like many glass facilities, there's a lot of scrap uh, that's generated at the, at, 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 in the process. Don't worry about the particulars of this chart. It's a timeline. And what it shows is on the top, when do you know you have quality problems uh, under ordinary circumstances? The answer is you know you have quality problems when the glass comes out. What if you could foresee the quality problems before they happen? And by studying 40 or 50 parameters continuously in the furnace, we were able to, with a very high degree of accuracy, predict one or two or even three days in advance when quality problems will arise, give the operator a signal, help them prevent the problem that's about to happen, and thereby increase the first pass yield. If you increase the first pass yield of the process, you are automatically reducing the energy content per unit of glass. And as those of you who study sustainability well know, manufacturing is growing in size all the time relative to the rest of the world economy. It accounts for almost 30% of global greenhouse gases. There's been no effective solution for dealing with manufacturing emissions. The answer is going to be in using data to make manufacturing more productive. And this is a great use case about how to achieve meaningful improvements in sustainability from data that's already there. One of the things we really focus on, I mentioned outcome. Uh, a lot of software companies are driven by investors and market conditions to think about product and subscription and shipping software. And uh, there are a lot of great services companies out there that wrestle with data. The answer, we believe, is to actually think about both. you got to have a product for scale, but you got to work really, really closely and partner with your client around results. And our approach has been to develop, uh, in the tradition of Jeffrey Moore's concept of whole product, a combination of services around a very strong technology product, most important, with a culture of focus on outcome with our clients, to get results. And the picture on the right here is a couple of uh, a couple of good friends at a company uh, who wanted to put a screen up so they could see all day long what was going on and, um, and uh, put our product to work. With that, I will uh, uh, pass the mic over to uh, Gilberto. Look forward to your questions. Thank you.
And thank you, John. Uh, great to be here with you and Dale. Thank you to Momenta Partners team for having us in here. So hello, everyone. My name is Roberto. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Smartex. So just to let you know very quickly what motivated Smartex to start. So one of the largest problems in the textile industry, one of the largest manufacturing industries, it is the production of defects in textiles. So for you to have an idea, every year, the defective production is responsible for the loss of more than $33 billion only in raw material. This happens because once a defect is produced, it turns into complete garbage, affecting the textile company's gross margin, affecting the environment, and even affecting the retail prices in the clothing shops. So in our specific case, we have Dale here uh, with the digitization of knowledge and John with the digitization of, of uh, the, the way that the data is consumed by enterprises. And we are now uh, digitizing the way that the textile rolls are produced. So very quickly, um, this is the textile manufacturing process, which has several sources of defects across several stages of production. It is a very vertical uh, industry. And uh, once a defect is produced, it tends to accumulate and propagate until the end when they are found that the defect become garbage and someone has to pay the bill, which most of the times are the needing companies because is where the majority of the defects are produced. So in the needing companies is definitely where the pain is bigger and that's why we are focusing in the needing stage for now. So for those who don't know, this is a circular needing machine. This is the fastest way to produce fabric that the industry knows. All the t-shirt fabrics, Ports where in general are produced on these types of structures. You can see uh, the video, but there is a basically a rotative structure down there with the textile roll being produced down there and spinning very, very fast. So you have the textile operators around the machine operating it normally, but as you can imagine, it's barely impossible to have some sort of visual inspection in real time. So what they do is once in a while, they remove the textile roll and send it to the inspection stage where they have inspection machines and inspection people that stay there all day and all night looking to fabrics and trying to spot defects with their own eyes. As you can imagine, this is a difficult job for a person and even if they were perfect, they cannot avoid effective production. They just inspect it after it is being produced. So in Smartex, we developed this system of camera, which is hardware, this camera bar over here um, that you can plug and play inside the rotative structure of the circular linear machines in order to capture images of everything that is being produced in real time. And by using machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence, we can learn all the textile patterns and detect all defects and irregularities in real time, intervening in the machine itself by stopping it, for example, and reducing the defective production to close to 0% of defect. Just to be clear, 0% of defect. This is very meaningful for the textile business owners that nowadays are used to work with 3 to 5% of defect in the $3 trillion industry where they have like 10% gross margin. So this is very meaningful for their pockets. So just to let you know that uh, we have uh, an installation fee since we sell hardware, which is one of our assets, but we also work with monthly fees and licenses for our software that supports all the infrastructure and all the digital assets management that we provide that we'll discuss uh, later on which assets are those. And for that, I would like to share a use case uh, here in Europe um, in one of our uh, customers, which is called Tintex Textiles, the leading manufacturing for uh, textiles in terms of knitting and dyeing stage uh, in Europe. And this is uh, one of their circular knitting machines an average factory usually has uh, 30 machines, 50 machines, sometimes hundreds of machines. Um, and if we go to China, sometimes thousands. So this is just one example uh, with a machine where we installed our system of cameras down there. And of course, a small touchscreen for a basic interaction with the operators. And the digital assets that we are acquiring and management uh, are basically the, the images of the textiles and all the characteristics that these images carry with them. And so in order to provide an additional value with these assets, uh, we create a platform where we can manage those assets and create, for example, a digital version of the textile role. This is like the Facebook profile of a textile role. 
so you don't need to open the textile row anymore just to check the quality. You can simply scan the QR code and see the digital version of this textile row with all the coordinates of the defect, the resume, the quality, if the role is class A, B, or C. You can do that also for management of, of, your, of your own clients. In this case, uh, we also provide a real-time inspection and monitoring system where they basically can log in wherever they, where, where they are and just see the images in real time of what it is being produced. And this basically carries a sense of security guard that many, many times fails in this industry. And ultimately, we also provide, of course, statistics um, in real time or in the end of the month uh, about the performance of their machines, their shifts, their manufacturing production, and just to give you as an example for this particular client in the month of February 2020, we are talking about an average saving of 1,000 US dollars per month per machine. So then you need to multiply by the numbers of machines that they have installed. And this, of course, is not just um, a money saving because all of these fabrics, they, it will be garbage later on in the stage, so we need to count with the downtime of the machines of course, with the kilogram saved, the water in the dyeing house, which is a massive amount of water just to dye a couple of textile rolls, the energy, and of course, the CO2 emissions. So with that, I thank you so much, and I'm opening for questions. Excellent. Well, thank you, Gilberto, and thanks to the entire panel. Very interesting and clearly impactful solutions. Now, as Ken noted at the beginning, I'm Blaine Matthew, and I'm part of Momenta's advisory practice that is focused on both the small and mid-sized innovators, like the companies you've seen here, as well as larger companies that are the users of such solutions. And remember, everyone, please do feel free to enter any questions for Ken, Dale, John, or Gilberto into the chat window. So why don't we kick off with a question maybe to the entire panel. Uh, let's see. Ken mentioned uh, the meager 23% success rate for IoT-related POCs. And I presume from what we've seen here, your success rates are probably somewhat higher, but is, is that true? And, and why is that the case? Why are your POCs more successful? Maybe let's start with Dale from Rev2. Thanks, Blaine. Well, I mean, 23%, I think I might slip my wrist and, you know, End it all, so to speak. <laughs> so, so, yes, we, we do much better than that. Uh, the reason for us is uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, ultimately, we've built a standard product, and the product that we've built does what it says it does. Uh, there's a knowledge component uh, or capture component to what we do in Rev2, but there typically aren't technical challenges on a per-project basis. So, you know, the core capabilities of the product generally does the same thing and behaves in the same way for each and every customer. And that helps us to, you know, deliver ROI that we're going to say in, in a good way. Uh, additionally, we have a program we call Right Start. And under our Right Start program, we actually uh, implement on behalf of the customer their first product. So uh, they generally pick a product or an area of the process that they want to capture the expertise for. Uh, we'll actually do that and get them up and running. So we provide kind of a roadmap for them to use on how to implement it further. Uh, part of that right start, we also do an analysis on the things that are impacting their organization. And from there, um, from that impact, you know, we're able to focus our efforts in the most meaningful way. That makes a lot of sense, Dale. What, what do you think, John, about the uh, success of POCs and how you get uh, projects not stuck in POC purgatory? So love the question and have views uh, very consistent with Ken and Dale. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, as I was thinking about the number 23%, I'll bet four or five years ago when everybody, including the young companies starting this area, were interested in doing pilots and POCs, that was probably our our success rate as far as converting a pilot into an ongoing commercial relationship. In the last two years, we have uh, declined to do pilots. Uh, we've done only commercial relationships. But very importantly, we think a lot with our clients about the psychology of risk and risk mitigation. 
I've never really precisely done the math, but I would suspect our our rate of going from kind of a first year uh, annual engagement on to multi year is 80 percent. And much like Dale, we've thought a lot about why do people do PLCs in the first place, and it's really about it's really about managing risk. And interestingly, we believe it's not about financial risk. Large manufacturers have the resources to do this. It's really about career risk. The brave soul who says we should try something new knows that in most companies, if they recommend that and it doesn't work, that's going to be a challenge for them in the organization. So what we've uh, come to is uh, very confidently saying to clients, Let's do some real uh, smart work up front. Let's really think about value. Let's take a look at your data. The technology is never really the problem. The data is never the problem. Let's really think through if your organization is ready to do this. And we will agree that if we don't hit a very minimal target in the first year, if we don't raise your OEE or whatever it is we focus on, we'll give you your money back. And that's really meant to take away the risk for the person who's advocating for change in their organization. That combination of careful work up front, qualifying companies and opportunities well, and taking away risk, we think that's the way to get to scale fast. Very interesting. So your no pilots uh, policy, do you, do you find some clients are just so stuck in the mentality of doing a pilot that, that you can't bring them into this, this way of thinking? A few. I think um, what's benefiting everybody uh, is that most companies now, as Ken's statistics showed, have some experience. And speaking candidly, most companies have a lot of pilots that didn't work and a lot of frustration. So a couple years ago, I think I would have said, you know, people still want to do pilots. Uh, companies are as tired of doing pilots as, as the technology providers are. So we find very few situations now where people say, Listen, I just got to do a pilot no matter what. But if you take the conversation to risk, then then you get to really how to sort it out. Yep, cool. Gilberto, your thoughts on doing pilots and how you get not stuck in pilot mode? Uh, yeah, here I have to agree with Dale. The product needs to do exactly what we say it does. Um, do not forget that many times we are talking about new technology that had never been in the market, nothing similar. So usually you are talking with clients that are in the, in the pilot land and they are usually innovators and visionaries. And as you know, these folks uh, usually are not happy with, um, with the product. They want always extra features, extra features, and they want to have the, the premium of being the first one using this new technology. So this might explain a little bit those uh, numbers about the, um, the POC success um, because these folks, many, many times they are not completely happy until they have uh, the new feature that they want. And yes, I need to agree with Dale. We need to define very, very well from the beginning what are the features and deliver exactly that. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, a different question or a question from, did somebody else want to add something? No? All right. A question from the audience here around signing outcome-based contracts, maybe in terms of having a base fee and then a shared a risk or, or reward component. I think you maybe sort of talked about this, John, but uh, do you want to talk a little more about that? And sure. then Dale or Gabotar, if you want to dive sure. in. I'll share a few observations. And, and you know, the, the first comment is we're all learning, everyone's figuring it out, so we don't, we don't claim to have this fully figured out. Uh, we have explored true outcome deals where you share the upside. Uh, companies are very reluctant to do it because it's, it's potentially quite unbounded and significant. We, we were speaking with a plant the other day that's increasing its throughput 15%. They don't want to share a third of that with us. Uh, and so uh, the program I described to you is really about managing downside risk, uh, but the client keeping all of the upside. Uh, uh, that will be a temporary feature for us. I think as this market matures, companies will be more comfortable. There will be more social proof. But fundamentally, we're always quite open to any form of risk or value sharing because there's so much value to be generated here. A couple of other comments because, you know, when companies really start to wrap their head around this, there's always an issue with attribution. People want to be very specific about 
well, this would have happened without the technology, and it's impossible to kind of figure out what percentage of, of causation uh, goes with each side of the relationship. So we've learned to keep this really simple and pick really simple, concrete targets. The great thing about manufacturing, and the other thing I'll say is, nobody really trusts their own OEE numbers. So often the first thing we do is set a benchmark that people actually believe in. It's always lower than people think, which is bad news if, if, you, if you pride yourself in your OE, but good news if you think about opportunity. And so, you know, literally saying, hey, this is what we're going to try to achieve in the first year. If we don't, you can walk and we'll give you your money back. That's the most simplified form of this. Maybe there'll be more complicated, uh, true benefit sharing deals. Those are hard for companies. Uh, we're open to all of it. And I, I think the great thing about this industry is we're just getting started on the business models. We've got to keep it simple. We've got to make it so people who want to innovate can do stuff fast. There's a question I saw earlier um, uh, about how long does this take. You've got to get meaningful payback in the first year or the innovator and the company won't have any support. So we work really hard to get results within three to six months of signing a contract, and then you're off to the races. Thanks, John. Dale or Gilberto, any other thoughts on outcome-based uh, contracts or risk sharing with clients? Um, uh, this uh, is Dale. Uh, oh, please, Roberto, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Dale. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this is Dale at Rev2. Uh, we actually do something very similar to this. Uh, we call it put your money where your mouth is contracting. So uh, we have something we call green button pricing which uh, you know, effectively just charges each time the customer gets a positive outcome. So every time Rev2 helps someone diagnose an issue and troubleshoot a problem, you know, that's a billing event under that particular pricing model. So uh, for us, if we, don't, uh, if we don't deliver what we say we're going to do, then the system's free. So, uh, so it better be good <laughs> or we're in trouble. Uh, but that's uh, that's one of the pricing models that we use uh, with our customer engagements. That's a pretty powerful model. All right, Gilberto, please go ahead. Just, just very quickly agreeing with both of you. And, uh, yeah, definitely you need to mitigate the risk from whoever is taking the decision in the other side. That really uh, makes things faster. Uh, but just let you know that in our specific case, since we are selling more or less um, a security guard system, let's say, uh, that is basically making sure that the production is is, is a good production without defects. Um, we need to be very careful with these types of contracts because we are selling like airbags, you know. Uh, we just act if some accidents happen. Um, so I guess this is very product dependent. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, Dale, let me ask one that's more specific to Rev2. Obviously, the market, there's been a lot of talk about AI and machine learning for a few years now, and yet, you know, practical adoption is challenging in many industries. You talked about Tetra Pak. How did you convince them to take the plunge with AI and use your product in that context? Dale, you there? Okay, actually, maybe we'll let Dale uh, get off mute and we'll we'll come back to him in a second. So actually, let's turn to Gilberto. Are you with me, Gilberto? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, perfect. Uh, so your solution is interesting because you're targeting, obviously, a very specific industry, the textile industry. Do you see, you know, wider applicability for using, you know, these kind of, kind of technologies to improve quality and a lot of, you know, especially process manufacturing? In fact, we, we got a question earlier about can you use this system for a beer factory? I can imagine how you could potentially even use digital uh, visual detection technologies in, in that context. So how are, how are you thinking about uh, expanding beyond the textile yeah. industry at some point? Yeah, the textile industry is huge and there are lots of opportunities inside. But of course, you are right. Uh, we are not only targeting that. Uh, so we are building the entire system, the entire infrastructure, hardware, software, business, the way you install the devices. We are building everything to be as plug and play as possible and as versatile as possible in order to be prepared to go to other roll-to-roll -roll industries. If you think about it, a roll-to-roll -roll industry, basically, it has to do with the form that things are produced and transported. They are transported as a roll. So they are black boxes. Well, once you roll a roll, you don't see anything to inside. So you need to trust the guy that was inspecting it before it became a roll. So definitely we are positioning ourselves to be this solution, super easy to, 
to integrate before forming the role in metal industry, paper, plastics, films, even in some exotic productions that work as a role to role. We have been seeing lots of interest from lots of companies everywhere in the world. But of course, as a startup, we need to focus in the niche first and then expand from there. I'm glad you said that, Gilberto. Right, right on. So, Dale, by any chance, did we get you back? Yes, no, we got I, me back. I guess not. We did. Nope, okay, nope. perfect. I'm, did you hear I'm my eager. question? Did you hear my question about Petra Pack and AI? Uh, I did not, but uh, if you okay. would mind just doing a quick repeat, that would be great. No, no problem at all. So I was just talking about, obviously, a lot of talk about AI machine learning over the last few years, you know, actual adoption into practical, actual applications have still been, you know, relatively challenging in some cases. How did you convince Tetra Pak that they needed to take the plunge with AI uh, and your solution? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, Tetra Pak was kind of easy to convince. I mean, they're a, they're a 4.0 leader, and, um, you know, they're really eager to you know, not only digitize everything, but to take advantage of the analysis of that digitization. But with that expertise, you know, that kind of, um, you know, let's call it leading edge mentality, they also were very aware of some of the challenges that AI poses in adoption. And in particular, for them, they, they knew the training of an AI can be quite challenging, uh, knowledge capture as well. Uh, so, you know, with Tetra Pak, our main, um, you know, kind of obstacle to overcome was, you know, showing that we knew how to overcome those two obstacles. Uh, hitting the second one first, you know, Tetra Pak's goal was to capture expertise from their experts, the system specialists, and make it solve problems. You know, we actually did that in a little bit of an old school way. You know, we kind of created a social um, knowledge capture mechanism that they could put in the hands of these people as they did their day-to-day -day work. Uh, we estimated it took us about an extra 20% of their time on an individual problem to capture what they do. Uh, but that 20% spent on one person can then be used across the entire organization. So um, it's a pretty small price to pay in all. Uh, on the second issue, you know, most people realize AI is trained by examples. And, you know, most organization that we've seen, especially in problem solving, is just not an area that they have data on. You know, if they capture issues, they don't capture root cause. Uh, they certainly don't capture what they did to fix things. And uh, it's almost always, you know, uh, kind of a greenfield, you know, environment from a data perspective. So we did something called uh, hints. Uh, we taught the AI, you know, uh, through uh, hints. We give it, uh, you know, think of it kind of the equivalent of teaching a child not to touch a stove. You know, if we can teach the AI that way, then the AI can come out of the gate operating at an expert level. And as it, uh, as it is used, it takes that to the next level, you know, where it can gain insight from the crowd. So those were really the two innovations that we did that got Tetra Pak over the hump. Really, really interesting. Some great thoughts there. All right. The next question uh, was directed to John, but I think I'm going to ask everyone because I think it's, it's the, answer, the answer would be interesting across the range of solutions. So for a complex manufacturing company, how long is it generally from sort of first contact or maybe contract signing to first improved outcome to 100% implementation? So what's the general implementation life cycle and, and timeline? Why don't we start with John on this one? For the implementations we do, the general or average implementation time to get screens up, data modeled, uh, and start getting engagement with the product and initial results is two to three months. I believe there is an aspect of the question too, which is, you know, how long to go to the full process? And mm -hmm. because of the way our product works, we're actually ingesting data from as many sources as possible. So when we really go live, we're able to understand things like cycle time and discrete, uh, behavior of a continuous process quality and so on. It does take a couple months for people to really get comfortable with the product. We take a lot of feedback. We'll customize some stuff. Um, usually we see very strong results within six months. I will tell you that the bulk of the time to get it going is actually calendar time. It's not a bunch of work and it's Stuff like punching hole through firewalls, 
IT work on the client side. In the past, you know, the bad versions of this, it's taken a year. And that's why I mentioned earlier that we spend so much time up front doing pre-work in the sales process because if you get the kind of foundation for this right, you can go really fast. Ultimately, the time frame is a function of organization, communication, and coordination. But if, if you know, if we can't get results in six months, uh, and in some cases considerably less, that's that's atypical. Yeah, yeah I need to agree with you, John. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Blaine. Uh, no, just go ahead, Gilberto, uh, please. Just to add up the point that uh, this is also super dependent on the on the product itself um, and then the level of integration that you are going to do in the in the factory. But um, from my experience, if you're talking about one to two or, or maximum like six months, it is fine for like everyone involved. So we usually try to show them the results and make sure they understand the results in two or three months. Um, which is nothing for for industrial um, C levels or managers. Yeah. Yeah. Dale, what do you think about time to value for Rev2? The um, you know Rev2 is a packaged product, so it comes out of the box usable. So someone can actually download it off of an app store, create an account, and you know if they have expertise at their hand, at their ready can, you know, put that into the product within a day and start using it, you know, uh, especially if they have a good handle on what their top issues are, you know, the old 80-20 rule. It doesn't take long to put uh, meaningful content in. I'd say in a practical sense, you know, where companies, um, you know, are looking to capture things on a larger scale, for us it's usually about four to six weeks, you know, from inception, you know, running through a right start program, and getting a full implementation that they can, you know, get meaningful impact from an ROI perspective. Well, that's Blaine and John, I just time. want to mention one other yeah. thing. The numbers we're all giving you, I'll, I'll bet I can say this for our, for our company for sure. That's the first time through. Uh, in many enterprises, you'll have plants that make similar products. We have significantly more uh, speed uh, uh, second plants, you know, two through N can be as fast as a month or less uh, once we've once we've understood the IT and data environment at a company's first plant. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. All right, we're almost at the top of the hour. I'm gonna let's do one more quick question here. Uh, most of your solutions, at least Rev2 and Sight Machine, you know, are generally applicable across a, bri a wide range of industries. Obviously, smart text for now is focused very much on textile. But for Rev2 and Sight Machine, how necessary is it for you to have domain expertise or do you have domain expertise across all these different types of systems and manufacturing? Or, uh, you know, or is that supplied by partners or is it supplied by the client themselves? So reflect on the notion of bringing domain expertise to the uh, beyond your product expertise to a client. Maybe starting with John. Love the question. Uh, first off, most people don't believe that the same product can work across multiple industries. It does, but I appreciate and respect the question, and we're always glad to convince or prove people of that. That said, um, it's, it's also very important to emphasize, we never hold ourselves out or believe that we're going to be more expert in the process than the client. The client always knows a lot about their process, and we engage with subject matter experts to help set up our, our data models and configure the product and, and kind of set up the screens that people are going to use. The last comment I'll make is doing this 10 years and the kind of people we've been fortunate to hire, we actually do have a lot of domain expertise. Once you've worked in glass or automotive, uh, food and beverage, uh, chemicals, you learn things and we obviously uh, take what we've learned uh, about how to help a client in an industry and we use that, that knowledge to help other clients so I would say that the product itself is not domain specific. We have some domain specific knowledge. We always look to partner with our clients because they're the experts. Makes sense, Dale. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of echo uh, what John just said. I mean, ultimately, you know, we're not experts in what our customers do. We're experts in problem solving and applying it to you know the, the challenges that they have. So, you know, we're, you know, very good at expertise capture and then turning that into ROI. Now, with that said, you know, uh, we have, 
you know, realize that each industry has some uniqueness to it. And, uh, you know, we have a pretty experienced team. You know, we have a lot of broad experience across, you know, customer service areas, uh, you know, plant maintenance type areas and plant operation areas. And that's helped us to gain insight to how those operations do the things that they do. And that, you know, enabled us to kind of, you know, build the product the way we did so that it can be applicable to such a broad range of things. So we don't usually come in trying to talk about, uh, you know, specific process objectives. We actually talk about how improved problem solving can reduce time, and that in yep. turn can drive their objectives. And that's really our focus. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, thank you for that panel. These were great, a, a great presentation, great uh, answers to the questions for everyone that submitted questions as well. And Ken, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap it up. All right. And I know we're running tight on time. So look, in summary, how can you create digital industry impact? And we've captured four key insights here. Number one, think global. Start with clear goals and objectives. As John said, focus on the outcome. As he said, quantifiable outcome, even at the earliest conversations. Number two, act local. Focus on low-risk, high-visibility opportunities, as Dale did with Tetra Pak, creating a new capability, customer self-service. Number three, grow organically. Scale your success upon measured success. And Gilberto demonstrated that with Tintex, focusing on what he considered the highest value use case of, of, of knitting to begin with. Number four, partner for success, and this really was the last few minutes of conversation. Note the language today, focus on value and outcomes, solving specific pain points, sharing risk, results in three to six months, experts in problem solving. Um, and then count on the other hand, the number of times you heard technology, right? These are quote unquote technology vendors who may know more about the domain than many of their clients and certainly uh, consulting firms in there as well. So there is a lot to be said for engaging and partnering for success early and often really scaling impact to create impact at scale. Sorry about that. All right. So in, uh, in closing, if you like the webinar and the real world insights, then we invite you to visit our digital industry insights at momenta.one. Over 600 insights, 96 podcasts, and 20 plus webinars for practitioners of digital industry by practitioners of digital industry. Finally, a special thank you to our speakers, John, Dale, and Gilberto, to the Momenta production team, Blaine, Sandra, and Sarah, and most of all to you, our listening audience. We appreciate you, and we hope you have a great day creating impact in your digital industry. Thank you. Take care.